I was um, at boarding school in Tekukusha College and um, I was one of the students who did quite well and there was a program that chose students even before the SPM results so on forecasted results to go to Australia for our sixth form. At the time, you know, you, you, you're 17, you're barely 17, you kind of like, okay lah. I went there really not knowing that was what I wanted to do because I don't come from a family of doctors at all. Then in Australia, I did okay in my high school certificate and got a place at Monash to do medicine. Once um, you graduate, then you do your internship. You, in Australia, you almost have to decide to then be channeled into which specialty training. So it was between cardiology and infectious disease. The more I got into cardiology, the more I realised it's a mono, mono system problem. You're just looking after the heart, you know. Whereas infectious disease, you're looking after the whole person. So again, uh, I was still a medical student when HIV AIDS was described. Uh, I still remember I was in my fourth year uh, when you know the, the whole um, phenomena was described and then you know it, it became more and more interesting and then as part of the training I was at a, a specialist infectious disease hospital called Fairfield Infectious Disease Hospital it's this the atmosphere was so nurturing and, and conducive it was that sense of teamwork collegiality um, between consultants and trainees was, was just fantastic. I had some of the most amazing patients. Um, I used to teach as well at Fairfield. We would get students from both Monash and Melbourne Uni. And uh, you know, and you take them to, to see these patients and you know, they, they taught us a lot. Imagine facing, facing death, facing rejection, facing stigma, the strength that they uh, brought with them, you know, the resilience. So all those things, you know, um, really taught me compassion, empathy, you know, that, that medical school curriculum find it very hard to teach, and, but it just was part of the environment that I trained in. It was, it was you know, amazing. It's a big responsibility, especially at the International AIDS Society level. It's a very big organisation. Um, it's a huge honour to, to lead the IAS. It has about 16,000 members all around the world. You know, and, and those who came before me as presidents are really the who's who of HIV science leadership. So it was, it was a real honour to be elected. But now, of course, we have another pandemic, and so we, we really are at a time when how do we, how do we continue to put HIV AIDS at the forefront of um, the response and, and truly try and achieve um, the global goal of ending AIDS by 2030. So I feel this huge burden as president of the IAS to, to keep sending that message to keep reminding countries and funders and you know other scientists and community groups to you know we've, we've got this last mile to to achieve yeah well going back we've got traditional tools like condoms we've got clean needles and syringes we've got you know methadone for people who use drugs we've got um, uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, you know, that's been shown to prevent people from acquiring HIV. And we've got this amazing treatment that can bring down the level of HIV to what is known as undetectable, so people who are living with HIV do not pass the virus to others, whether it's to their babies or to their sexual partners. Or, or... So we, we have all this already. The only thing that we don't have is an effective vaccine but we've got lots of things that we can, you know, really put an end to AIDS. But uh, it, it goes back to political will, financing, stigma, discrimination, criminal laws, policy, that, that's stopping us, really. HIV is one of those diseases that's not just medical right and that in a way was what attracted me to it that's a whole 
other um, what we call social determinants of health. You know, all these things uh, makes it a really rather complex disease. So yes, we have all the biomedical tools, we have all the pills to prevent HIV, we have all the pills to treat HIV, but surrounding that are all these issues, these this barriers, the, the stigma, discrimination, um, laws. But I don't think we're not getting anywhere, especially when it comes to drug laws. Um, for me, every single little win is a win. I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that something like changing the country's drug laws is not going to happen overnight. So even the very fact that we've now, we now have the government talking about, you know, um, uh, shifting the, the response to uh, looking at drug use as more of a health and social issue rather than purely from a criminal justice system. To me, that's already a big win. Yes, there's still a lot to do. There's th four holy grail in HIV, I guess. One is cure, one is vaccine. Number three is stigma and discrimination, how to overcome stigma and discrimination. And number four is once you found all those three, how to implement it to scale. I mean, part of the problem in medicine, not just in HIV, is we make all these great discoveries but we're not very good at implementing and let alone scaling them up with the exception of the COVID vaccine. You know, there was, there was this urgency, right? The whole world was going to collapse. And so as soon as we found the COVID vaccine, we, we scaled that up pretty well, apart from, you know, the inequities that exist in, in rolling it out in Africa and many other countries. But so I think there's still plenty of research that needs to be done in, in in many areas but you know in those four specifically in those four fields and this is where you know we keep the research in HIV alive um, people do their research they present they network they see their research being um, uh, expanded they see their research being implemented so I think we the IS plays a very big role in continuing that that excitement uh, around research so that's at the global level and finally of course locally two things there um, of course Chiria uh, and we're working very very closely with um, my colleagues at Yale also a partnership that's been going for more than 15 years with Professor Rick Altis. we have currently I think five or six NIH grants a big one for the prison project and uh, several on um, using uh, mHealth or digital technology to reach out to vulnerable populations like MSM and transgenders. So there's four or five ongoing projects at the moment with Yale. And of course the one that Rick and I are most proud of is um, what we call the MISS program, the Malaysian in Implementation Science Training Program. It's a five-year grant from Fogarty uh, Institute of the NIH. And uh, we've structured the grant in such a way that we select two PhD students and two faculty members to be trained in implementation research. So they, they, um, they participate in lectures that are given by the Yale faculty online and they go to New Haven for five months um, to get in-depth training in implementation research and we have an annual boot camp here in KL. So the reason why I'm particularly proud of that is of course when you talk about what do I leave behind after this I think that will be it you know and, and we're hoping to turn it into a, a master's in implementation science the other aspect of it is we've also got a grant from WHO to uh, also do implementation science. So we're marrying that together. It's a consortium with UN University as well as Ministry of Health. That's the WHO program. So we, we, we're aligning all that together. Uh, I'm very keen to, to, apart from mentoring, is to institutionalize some of these things because, like what you said, you know, it's got to be, it's got to be inbuilt. In, otherwise once I leave it will go, uh, right? So I don't want that to happen. And 
this is the other insane project I did. <laughs> After changing the undergraduate curriculum, I thought I will tackle the postgraduate curriculum. Of course, that's not so simple because it's not just UM, it's 10 other universities and Ministry of Health and 23 specialties. About five years later, we now have uh, 11 curriculum that's ready and I'm, I'm extremely proud of this because it was and a lot of people worked hard on it. But now I think we're ready to implement them and hopefully once again it will be uh, a legacy we can all be proud of because the aim of this curriculum is really to train um, specialists in a more modern way, in a, in a, in a competency-based uh, framework that, that's been practiced in, by you know, advanced nations. But the one that I, I regret, I guess, is another crazy big idea, is <laughs> the UM Health. That didn't go so well from, from my point of view. I mean, um, you know, towards the end of my deanship, I think we had, we were working with PwC and, and we've, we had the plans uh, for the implementation phase, but unfortunately it's, well, it, it, it's not going in the way that I, I would have liked it to go, so I've taken a step back from it. And, um, but you know, um, yeah, uh, I, 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 I take failures, I learn from it, um, and move on. Well, you know what, someone texts me today and thank me for, for you know, she, she, Prof Wu has just been awarded um, the FIGO award for being, you know, a world, world leader in obstetrics and gynecology and she said, you know, she wanted to thank me as part of her ascent, if you like, um, you know, because I've mentored her in a way and, and lifted her. And to me, you know, as, as there are two things that I'm most, when people ask me what, what do I think are my biggest achievements and number one would be my children. Number one, two and three would be my children. And they've both graduated and one started working and hopefully the, inshallah, the younger one will start working. And they, apart from that, they, they're also very sensible, well-rounded people, you know. So that, without a doubt, is my biggest achievement. And second would be, I think, I think I have encouraged and mentored and quite a number of people um, that I, I, I'm very proud of, uh, either the infectious disease team, Prof Iskandar, Sharifa, Sashila, Dr Wong, even Dr Noliza, uh, who's now in private. So that's one group of people, you know, who have made name, you know, name for themselves now. Dr. Rina, uh, who's doing fantastic translational work. And then on the Churia side, Dr. Ika, Dr. Rumana, and, and uh, you know, Asan, and so many, so many people that I hope, you know, I, I, I can, can be the next generation of people who, who continue the work.